Uh, okay. What's up, everyone? Uh, Goldie here, and we are going to be going over uh, the Monday main slate. We have a more manageable nine gamer um, than the 12, 14, 15 games that we sometimes get in baseball. Um, like these nine gamers, they're, uh, at least for me, a little bit, um, a little bit easier to get a handle on, obviously, because, you know, we're, we're going through all kinds of numbers and data and, and whatever. Um, that said, we do have projections and, and ownership early runs loaded to the site this morning. This is a very early look at, uh, how we're looking. Of course, we have DeGrom on the mound today leading the way in projection and ownership. This is a big number. Pretty similar to Garrett Cole yesterday. Was about five points higher than anybody else. Today, DeGrom is, what is that, well, six and seven points higher uh, than everybody else. We got some good arms on the mound today, right? You get Gosman against Houston. This might be an interesting tournament spot. Um, generally don't like going after Houston, but they've been pretty cold to start the season. In aggregate, could be an all right play. Certainly if, if DeGrom's ownership starts to steam, as it likely will throughout the day, um, Kevin Gosman's will come down commensurately. So could be a, an interesting tournament play at just 100 bucks more. Uh, Zach Wheeler against the White Sox, also an interesting tournament play. Um, he has not been kind of peak Zach Wheeler so far yet this season, and he doesn't get the greatest matchup here. Uh, 9,600 price tag is a little bit elevated, um, but still seeing some healthy ownership on him for sure at 18% so far. Uh, Christian Javier on the other side of the Houston game here gets Toronto. Pretty bad strikeout matchup naturally for him, of course. Um, so it, another interesting tournament play. I think the price tag is pretty intriguing here at 9,200 because just below him you have Corbin Burns, who is, who's going to be 35% owned in a lot of stuff. Uh, he gets Seattle at 88. Now this is an interesting sort of ownership um dynamic we've got going on with with Corbin Burns here he was five percent owned in his last start and he he went to town now he gets a worse matchup in Seattle and he is more expensive I believe um and the ownership figure has you know went 6x I think something like that right so um could be an interesting pivot to get to to Javier Dustin May, however, uh, at 8,400, I think the price tag is probably a bit high for this particular matchup. Mets been seeing the baseball, and they're continuing their their sort of West Coast trip after they really, uh, I mean, yesterday they kind of disappointed, but they put up a real crooked number against James Caprillion on Saturday, I believe. So um, a lot of these guys over here for the Mets heating up a little bit. Dustin May doesn't have quite the stuff that we'd like to target. Uh, Lance Linsing, a little bit of ownership here as well at 8,100. Um, there's value at this price tag for sure. Matchup certainly isn't great. Of course, Philly also seeing the baseball. And they went off against the Reds in Luis Sessa yesterday. Max Fried, he'll be back today. 8,100, same price as Lance Lynn. Um, Fried just had a hamstring and wasn't all that serious, but uh, he came out of his first start. He actually went several innings uh, before he tweaked something. So he should be fine. He gets San Diego. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, Jack Flaherty gets Arizona today, 7,800. He's been better in his last couple of starts. Still walking people and still having uh, trouble really just throwing it over the plate. Um, so interesting deeper tournament stack here with Arizona, perhaps. Merrill Kelly gets St. Louis on the other side. Probably not for Merrill Kelly, just not a lot of strikeout upside. Um, there's definitely suppression upside, as St. Louis has really been um, pretty cold to start the season offensively. Kyle Freeland and Pittsburgh uh, are at Coors Field today. Kyle against the Pirates, no thank you. Um, 
probably going to see some pretty heavy ownership on the Pirates, naturally. And down here, on the other side, Colorado gets Rich Hill. Uh, you're certainly not playing him. He throws 40% curveballs, and it's not going to break at Coors Field. So, um, no, that's a total non-starter. Uh, let's see. David Peterson here gets the Dodgers. Um, yeah, it's an all right price tag for the strikeout upside that he offers. He's got a high ground ball rate, but uh, probably still don't want to be going out for the Dodgers all that much. Kyle Muller for the A's against the Cubs uh, at home. This is maybe an interesting tournament piece here, but most of these guys down here are projecting anywhere from 10 to 13 points or something. Um, not all that much difference between them. Sans Rich Hill, of course. Chris Flexen, probably going to miss the cut for me as well, as will uh, Jordan Lyles and Ryan Weather. So that said, that's, um, you know, we've got a little bit more time, so that's kind of why I wanted to go through just sort of an overview of where we are. Um, DeGrom, I think, is still just underpriced, and it's going to be with this projection delta to everyone else. I mean, when you run teams... Um, just with the raw projections before make any before making any adjustments for ownership and and who you want to play and you know all that kind of stuff uh, <laughs> like a lot of optimizers would probably struggle to give you less than a hundred percent of of the grom um, you'll get some of these guys because these are, these numbers are good you know 19 points from burns here so far that's it's a big number um, but there's just such a such a big difference between DeGrom and everybody else here that uh, it's going to be pretty hard for you not to get a lot of him. Um, and in certainly, you know, single entry and and three max and, and all that kind of stuff, um, fading DeGrom is uh, probably not the greatest idea today. And you'll probably want to get different with some of your hitters. That said, let's get into the games. Philly and the White Sox. Wheeler on the mound we talked about. Um, it's not really been excellent to start the year. And it's been kind of depressing um, because his price tag's come up now. And, I mean, it's, you know, it it should be this high for Wheeler pretty much always. Um, the aggregate numbers over the last, whatever, 170 innings are still fine, you know. Um Right, not throwing the split and the change or anything. Slider just marginal value. Curveball just marginal value. So the breaking stuff for Wheeler really hasn't been all that good. It's the four seamer sinker combo that he's really making the money with, right? Staying down in the strike zone, staying off the barrel, and still not walking people. So the suppression is fantastic. Uh, getting ahead in counts, obviously fantastic. Working off of the four seamer and the sinker. Um, but when he's getting to the breaking stuff, he's struggling a little bit. And that's what's made Wheeler a little bit vulnerable. So when we're paying upwards of 10000 for him, it makes me a little uneasy when I see this um, when I see this value. When he gets going, he's going to be just fine, and he'll be, he'll be spinning the slider and spinning the curveball just fine. Um, this particular matchup against the White Sox, I'm not super crazy about. Now, generally against right-handers, Wheeler is elite. He's really elite against both sides, to be honest. So it, the since the four-seamer and the sinker are so good, um, he can get away with some average and well below average, in the case of the curveball, stuff in terms of the, the breaking uh, arsenal, right? He can get away with some stuff. Uh, and that's really why we see a 28% K rate to lefties, 26% K rate to righties, no power allowed, right? No hard contact to speak of. A lot of soft contact, right? Pushing 20% to left-handers, 23% to righties. These are big numbers, really, really strong there. And that's what allows Wheeler to survive some pretty poor breaking stuff. Um, in this matchup in particular, we don't generally want to be going after the White Sox. They're, once again, just kind of average, right? So uh, these, this is the, the lineup from yesterday, but you get a peek at um, today's projections so far, just so I can illustrate that on the season um, for the White Sox against righties, right, 515 PAs, 
we've now got a, a large enough sample for at least the, the team aggregates, right, um, to start using this season's numbers. Just, what, two and a half, almost three weeks into the season here, uh, we can start using aggregates for the for the teams, and they're striking out just a 22.5% clip. Average, once again, low walk rate, so they're they're making you work and they're fouling off pitches, but they're not going to make a lot of hard contact necessarily. So most of their contact so far, as we can see, has been of the medium variety. Sub-30% aggregate hard contact rate. But the ISO is still low, still below 150. That's kind of a that's, – that's probably the threshold we look for uh, for a team aggregate. 312 WOBA, uh, it's about accurate, right? A lot of ground balls here, buck 40 ground ball to fly ball, right? Line drive rate sub-20%. You know, medial and average WRC plus at, at about 95 right here. So um, a little bit better against lefties, of course, right? When we look down here against their numbers against everybody, they've been better against lefties. And they naturally were because they're mostly right-handed heavy. Um, so they're a little bit more attackable against righties, but that doesn't suggest that they're overly attackable with righties, and especially with righties that have some subpar breaking stuff. Now, Wheeler is Wheeler. And given that we've got DeGrom at 500 bucks more expensive, Gosman's 600 more expensive, and some other guys in the range, that's why we're seeing depressed ownership on Wheeler right now. Um, however, is Wheeler in a fifth of your teams pretty warranted? He certainly has the upside, right? Uh, but do we want to be going after Chicago when there's probably some more attackable spots? Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. So uh, we'll have to see how it fleshes out when we start building teams, of course, right? But um, some, just something to consider. The slider and the curveball have, have not been good. And it's fastball um, fastball value that's really eking it out for Wheeler here. If he is not spotting the fastball, he's very likely to have pretty significant trouble. And you're taking some risk here at 9,600. Um, you know, that said, it, it, Wheeler's Wheeler, and, and the upside is there if you want to go after a pretty weak offense overall in the White Sox. Lance Lynn on the other side, 8,100 for Lance. Um, good start in his last outing, and we kind of talked about that. Having um, kind of expected a bit of a, a bounce and a rebound from getting totally destroyed by the Giants in that one outing, uh, giving up several homers like seven runs or whatever it was. He was good in his last outing at 23 DK points, something like that. Um, attainable price tag once again here. Do we want to go after the Phillies? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of scary to go after a, a team that just put up 17 the day before or whatever they did, 13, um, 11 in the first inning. Good hitters over here still. Against lefties, they are quite... I mean, they're good against both, right? Um, so we'll kind of go through the, the Phillies numbers here. They're going to be a, played a little bit. You're always going to see numbers on a cheap Bryson Stott leading off against a righty, right? Ownership numbers, that is. Same thing with Schwarber. You're always going to see ownership on him. Trey, you'll always see ownership on him. He's almost always the best play. Um, you know, raw numbers play at shortstop. So you're always going to see a little bit of of ownership come into these guys um sometimes we'll want it we'll just definitely want to come in under these numbers against a good arm over here in lance lynn um against righties in aggregate this season a lot of this is going to be a, a bit inflated by the the really big game they put up yesterday against luis sessa um but 185 iso compared to right just down here below 150 iso in aggregate for a team, I mean, 3% is 3%, and that's 3% more extra base hits that the Phillies are creating than the White Sox, right? And that over five and 600 plate appearances, uh, over an entire season of 2,000 plate appearances, that's a, that's a pretty significant difference. And 3% edge is a 3% edge, right? And then you have a very large edge in, in the WOBA category as well. Right, we're talking five and a half percent there, right? So, markedly better offense over here that is performing um, much better than than the White Sox. And I would say overall the matchup is pretty similar given the 
pretty weak breaking stuff for Wheeler, and that he's had a cold start to the season. It's still early for him. He'll be fine, right? And he'll he'll realize these strikeout numbers in aggregate, you know, over the full course of the season. But some variance with Wheeler a little bit sometimes. And Lance Lynn, number one, he's fifteen hundred cheaper, right? Seeing so similar ownership on him, but he's got a higher projection, right? In the early going here. So do we want to be attacking the Phillies? I don't know. I, it, I'm kind of lukewarm on the arms here in this game for the most part. Two good and, and pretty sticky offenses. Two good arms over here. Uh, I think Lance Lynn has more of a split weakness than does Wheeler, for sure. Uh, and the Phillies probably have a bit more in the way of platooning that they can... And guys that can take advantage of that split weakness... Notably, right, Bryson Stott leading off, Schwarber, of course, Brandon Marsh, he's been great, and he's at a very attainable price tag here, 3800 Pretty low ownership on him coming in so far. Um, Jake Cave had a good day yesterday, probably be in the lineup again today. So they've got some lefties over here that could make it a little difficult on Lance Lynn. The righties are probably going to struggle a little bit. Lance has always been pretty excellent against righties. It's the four-seamer sinker-cutter combination. Uh, the sinker, not great, of course, and that's what makes him a little bit more susceptible with the 204 ISO to lefties. 35% hard contact there. All right, this is why we attacked him with the Giants. Two homers per nine. It's a big number. So this makes it a little worrisome here. I believe we do have some weather. Uh, let's check. Here we go. Yeah, we got a freaking 18, 20 mile an hour wind going out to dead center here. So that kind of takes me offense off of offense, rather, a little bit here, um, uh, or off of the pitching, I, I should say, and puts me onto the offense a little bit more um, in this early game. I know we're kind of going over uh, going over this game quite in depth here, but uh, probably won't do this for the rest of the games. Um, but I think this is a really interesting spot because we have two good arms at some average ownership with high projections um, in a weather game in Chicago. Now, obviously, this isn't Wrigley, but at a b bigger ballpark over at whatever they, they call the White Sox field, uh, guaranteed rate. Um, but I think this is a very interesting game, and I think this might be one of the spots that we'll have to get right in tournaments tonight. Because, never, I mean, for sure, undeniably, 8100 for Lance Lynn. It's a very attractive price tag. Um, but I don't... Like I said, in a weather game, going after a team that can platoon against him. Um, and he's got a significant split here. He gives up a lot of power, a lot of fly balls, and a lot of homers to the left side of the plate. So um, not my favorite getting after arms here. Would prefer probably offense. And as of right now, they're probably going to be pretty ignored because we've got some pretty popular games later on the slate. So I think you could potentially pivot off of that and get to some of those guys in tournaments. Um, not crazy about full stacks, but um, you know, if anybody, I'd, I'd stack the Phillies, right, rather than full stacking against Wheeler. But some playable pieces there um, in any constructions, I think. And so here's DeGrom, 10-1, 55% ownership on him so far. But it, as we talked about, the projection is just sky high, and it should be. Uh, this is back-to-back -back starts for him against the Royals. Generally, I don't like targeting pitchers in back-to-back -back starts against the same team. Um, but this is DeGrom, and I will make an exception. <laughs> and and this is the Royals, too, of course, right? So um, they did get him for a couple of, couple of runs in his last outing, and we talked about a little bit of susceptibility for DeGrom. He's mostly just a two-pitch guy. Show me changeup, show me curveball. Changeup's just kind of average, though, because he's throwing it so freaking hard. It's basically... Uh, a league average fastball at 92-93, which is insane. Uh, he's got a 93-mile-an-hour slider. Insane. So those two pitches, the four-seamer and the slider, are incredible value and what really give DeGrom or make DeGrom so difficult for other hitters. Um, but the changeup is there, right? And that makes him a little bit susceptible to getting on the barrel. We talked about this. He's got a high barrel rate. And 
it's mostly because he throws so hard. The hard contact numbers are not the most elite in, in baseball, even though DeGrom is the top arm. And that's because he's throwing so hard, right? And if the four-seamer is straight, and he, for the most part, it, it pretty much is. It's a breaking pitch that, that really gets all the value for him. Um, there's so much value on the four-seamer here because it, he throws it so hard, right? He's throwing it at triple digits, and that's hard to hit no matter who you are. Um, but the four-seamer is, for the most part, straight, as are most fastballs, right? And when you're throwing that hard, even marginal hitters in the big leagues, they can barrel up 100. So that's his susceptibility. He's not going to walk people, and he's just going to throw it over the plate and, and let you hit it. He throws a lot of strikes, gets ahead of hitters, so there's no problem that we are really worried about with DeGrom, right? He's got a 40 three percent strikeout rate this is why you're very likely to get uh very close to 100 percent if you're just building teams um so there's a, there's nothing terribly worrisome here because once again this is the royals they got to him a little bit but he could still strike out 10 or 12 or something in seven innings here against the royals and he could give up three runs and you don't really care because he's still only 10-1. He's underpriced. He should be 13,000 here. And they should force it. I would. I really wish DK in a lot of these matchups would go back to their pricing of a few years ago. When we had Kershaw at 14,000, we had to make decisions. You know? Anymore, it's just like, okay, click into Grom and then, and then figure it out. So... That's probably what's going to happen in almost every tournament you play tonight. This number is pretty low as of right now. This is going to steam. It should steam uh, throughout the day. And if it doesn't, then um, I think that's a pretty exploitable spot for us against the field to get you know, leverage and, and more exposure. This strikeout rate is astronomical. I mean, I mean this is a video game number. So... Um, you know, despite the barrel rate and the hard contact, I don't care. <laughs> uh, if you want it, if you get 100% to Grom or 98% to Grom, and you want to play a couple of pieces on the other side, uh, I mean, more power to you. No, thank you. But 3,300 Vinny Pascantino is a pretty damn good play. He got into another ball yesterday. He's a good hitter over here. He's a young hitter, but. At this cheap price tag, he has, he has upside to pop through this price. Um, now, naturally, the, the hard contact for, number for DeGrom is a little bit higher against right-handers. Um, but I, I'm not playing a righty against it. Like, they got to deal with that slider, and I'm not I'm not doing it. So if anybody, even though he does give up, you know, 181 ISO to righties, um, I'm still not playing a righty against, uh, against DeGrom. Because the righties over here, Bobby Witt and Salvi Perez, notably, uh, they both strike out at about a 25-30% clip against right-handers. So, no thanks. Um, so, we're playing DeGrom again. Just get after it and don't play the Royals. Not, uh, like, if you want to play one Royal stack, just in the, on the off chance that DeGrom is bad, um, okay, go ahead. But don't do it in anything outside of a... Uh, 150 max, I would say. Jordan Lyles on the mound for the Royals. 5,400. I don't like this price. And Texas looks like they're heating up a little bit, um, even without Corey Seager. So they had a really good night against Houston last night, mostly due to a Marcus Semien granny. Um, but everybody in the lineup, when it when the top couple of guys at the lineup are starting to turn it over a little bit, uh, it has a a sort of... Um, cascading effect, if you will, uh, down to the rest of the guys. They're all seeing the baseball, and it puts them in better spots because they're hitting with runners on base and runners in scoring position. And that forces pitchers on the other side to maneuver a little bit. And pitchers maneuvering within counts... Uh, are not nearly as efficient as they are maneuvering um, in the you know in the early pitches of counts, early stages of counts, when there aren't any runners on base, for example, right? So you've got to be a little bit more cautious and careful with where you're placing the baseball uh, on 
on a 2-1 count with a runner on second base than you do with nobody on or something like that. So um, that said, it, it's not to not to say that Jordan Lyles uh, is is an option here for us, even at 5,400. It is to say that you could probably get to some Texas. Um, now, I don't have their, uh, their lineup in here. I just haven't updated it from yesterday or last night uh, to get us – any idea on ownership or, or whatever, but they'll probably be pretty popular. Uh, Coors Field naturally going to garner most of the ownership today. Um, and a couple other spots as well. So 5400 though, for Jordan Lyles. Occasionally, he will pop through this price tag. He has some suppression upside against right-handers. And... But really, unfortunately for Lyles, he's still giving up a lot of power to the lefties. 272 average, 360 Woba, 222 ISO, 33% hard contact rate with a 1.7 homers per nine. On the barrel, 10.5%. So you're not playing him. Texas does have, they did get Leody Tavares back, for example. Um, a little bit of a reprieve, having lost Corey Seager. Josh Smith, they still have in the two hole. Um, he's got like a 50 OPS or something. I mean, it's just terrible. <laughs> or, or, or OPS plus. Um, so he's been really, really bad. And he's still a young hitter, but they're trying to get him going in the two hole. Wouldn't be surprised if they put Leody up in the uh, up into two and try and get some offense going up at the top of the lineup with Semyon. Um, so you'll have to see how they platoon here. Uh, I would prefer the lefties mostly, but you can get to Semyon. He hits righties very well. He's a good fastball hitter also. And Jordan Lyles is pretty um, pretty lacking in the fastball department, as we can see from the value. 92 on the four-seamer and the sinker, and the sinker is just not a good pitch. That's why he's given up so much power to lefties. So we target mostly the lefties for the Rangers here against Lyles. Um, but you can you can full stack them. You can get to them. It'll be a decent tournament stack for sure. Okay, let's move on. Um, Arizona and St. Louis. Merrill Kelly on the mound for the D-backs. And Flaherty going for the Cardinals. 74 for Merrill Kelly. I like this price tag for him. I like playing him in tournaments uh, in general at this price tag. Because I think he's, he's got a good bit of upside in terms of suppression. Like, this is a good arm. He's got five full pitches, a very workable and plus arsenal here on pretty much every one of the pitches that he's throwing. Good fastball mix here with the four-seamer sinker cutter, similar to Lance Lynn, but eking out more value on each of the pitches compared to Lance Lynn. But he's also throwing a curveball, full 14 15% here, 21% of a changeup. Marginal value on them, but... They're there, and they're a decent secondary pitch. Makes him less vulnerable to raw power than a Lance Lynn, for example. So if I had to choose between the two, even in bad matchups, in a vacuum, I would play Merrill Kelly, number one, because he's cheaper, and he doesn't give up nearly as much. That said, I think the Cardinals are uh, they're pretty close to as bad a matchup as the Phillies are for Lance Lynn, right? So... The Cardinals, however, they've been really, really cold to start the season in aggregate on offense. But striking out here, we can scroll as we scroll over slowly. Um, striking out here, just a 21.5% clip against righties so far. Still creating slightly better than league average, 106 WRC+. 10% walk rate, so they're getting on base. They're patient over here are the Cardinals. But still with them, similar to the White Sox, 140 ISO aggregate as a team. Kind of frustrating to play them. 331 Woba, so they're going to get on base. They're going to hit for some average. 266 aggregate average as a team. That's a big number. 350 on base nearly. Good numbers here, but just not a lot of power, not a lot of upside quite yet. So against Merrill Kelly, I think it is an okay spot if you want to get to some pretty unowned Cardinals. Um, as we saw their ownership, all under... 6-7%. I think that's fine to go after Merrill Kelly. I think it's fine to take some tournament shots on him as well um, because I think in the in the 7K range, it's kind of a dead spot today. Um, we can just come quickly take a look once again. Kind of a dead spot here in, like, you're certainly not playing Kyle Freeland, right? 
And do you really want to play Flaherty? I don't know. We'll get to him in a second. Um, but that's it for guys in the 7K range. So it could get you to some interesting builds, I think, if you play a Merrill Kelly in some tournaments counting on some good suppression upside because he's got a 330 ERA with a 40 XFIP, buck 20 whip. He's not going to walk people, and he's going to stay off the barrel for the most part. Now, he's got a slightly elevated walk rate to the left side at 10%, but that doesn't really translate to runners scored. He's got such a workable arsenal with the, with the breaking pitch, the good changeup against lefties, and three very good fastballs that – he can strand runners. He can still get some ground balls and stay off of the barrel and keep himself out of trouble. So historically, we wanted to target Merrill Kelly with righties, but he's really, since he's introduced the cutter, he's neutralized a lot of that righty power, and we've seen that come down. The hard contact still above 31%, pushing 32 here um, for the righties. So perhaps maybe a little bit of attackability there, but inducing... Um, a, a decent bit of soft contact. Over 15%, we'd like to see this a little higher, of course, pushing 20. But fine numbers nonetheless, right? Nothing terribly worrisome uh, in terms of a raw production, I suppose, for really either side of the plate anymore, and that's because of the good arsenal. Now, K-rate, two lefties markedly lower, okay, sub 20% compared to 24% to the righty. So he has plenty of stuff here to get you there in tournaments at this price tag for a 20-some-odd point outing. And with a DeGrom on your teams uh, or something like that, I think that's a very workable number, and that could definitely get you there. Um, but like I said, you can still stack the Cardinals. they got plenty of power over here, and they don't strike out. So um, sometime they're, they're going to pop. And this 140 ISO number is going to start to climb up a little bit. There's just too many good hitters over here. Wilson Contreras really has not been one of them, but he might be starting to wake up a little bit, walking a little bit more, getting into some baseballs. So, of course, you got to get through Goldschmidt and Arenado. Uh, Alec Burleson, he was removed from the game yesterday, I believe. Uh, so I have to keep an eye on him. 4700 price tag on Donovan, still a bit too high. But... If you want to stack the Cardinals here, uh, I certainly wouldn't be leading off or leaving off their leadoff hitter. Flaherty on the other side, 7,800. Uh, I'm not doing this. I'm probably going to want to get to some Arizona here. Um, their price tags are reduced pretty significantly. And as of right now, we're not seeing a lot of ownership on them. It'll probably come up throughout the day. But this this makes it very easy to get to a an expensive DeGrom. And one of the other expensive arms. You want to run a Degrom Wheeler. Arizona is a stack that can that can get you there. Um, I like attacking Jack Flaherty because the walk rate still hasn't come down. He's been a little bit better in his in his last start or two, but I don't particularly care. He's still not throwing strike one. He's laboring way too much, making it very difficult on himself deeper in counts. Um, if you want to play Jack Flaherty, I mean go nuts <laughs> but uh, not for me he's giving up way too much power to the left side uh, here in the early going still a shortish sample 51 and the third aggregate innings 29 innings to to lefties but a 363 woba and a 195 iso with just a 21 percent k rate couple ticks below league average there 12 percent walk rate to the left side of the plate walk rate even higher to righties so when we're stacking teams against him we want the opposite end of the platoon to have the higher walk rate right same handed hitters we would like to have the high number right so he's putting those guys on base for free and then he's getting to the weaker end of his split in terms of production when guys are on base right so that's generally a pretty ideal stack scenario uh now he's not on the barrel so if we if this number were double this up at 10 percent, this would be a, a smash every single time um but the walk rate is just way too high and until this comes down in aggregate um i i, I still don't think he is a target on the mound at a pretty elevated price tag given that number the stuff isn't all that good and this isn't jack flaherty of 
few several years ago. Um, he's still working back from all the injuries, and the control and the command of mostly the four seamer here has just not been there. He can't throw for a strike, and when he does throw for a strike, it gets hit pretty good because it's a four seamer and it's right over the middle. So slider is still plus value for him. Breaking stuff is okay, and that's really all that he's been able to survive with so far. But um, when when the breaking stuff starts to fail him a little bit, he doesn't have enough value on the four seamer to get him out of at any trouble. So if he doesn't have a four seamer and then he doesn't have his breaking stuff and he's walking people, it, it could get ugly for him real quick. So I like Arizona uh, a pretty good bit uh, in tournaments tonight. And there'll be a decent pivot because the, the pirates are cheap as well. Decent pivot off of Coors Field for you. So some interesting tournament plays here for sure for the D-backs and the cards. Mostly Arizona for me. Toronto and Houston. Let's get on to this. Um, Houston's been pretty disappointing, at least their offense uh, so far this season. So I think we could maybe target some Kevin Gosman. He is probably going to see a lower ownership number than this 12 and a half. Uh, by the time we get to lock, um, because DeGrom's number is likely to steam. And Gosman has actually, in his last two starts, gone deep. He's gone seven and eight innings, and that's really been the problem that we've had with Gosman, going over six innings. And when we're paying this price tag for him, that's the risk that we take, that he's just going to throw 90 pitches, be spiking the splitter here, and not able to strike anybody out. Now, still... Houston, in general, is a, a pretty bad strikeout matchup. However, I did allude to in the opening here that they're striking out a little bit. They've been attackable here. They're still walking a ton, right, creating about league average, 96 WRC plus so far. But look at this ISO number. 105 ISO for the Astros is a pretty shockingly low number. 24% K rate so far against righties this season. So I think they could be attackable, and I think this – tends toward Kevin Gosman being a pretty decent tournament play in some teams that you may not get to DeGrom. If you want to play in both, sure. There's a couple of cheap stacks that you can get to. If you want to play Arizona and Pittsburgh, that can get you there with both a, a Gosman and DeGrom or something like that. Um, so at, at depressed ownership here, I think this is a, a relatively acceptable tournament play. Uh, certainly DeGrom is the by far the favorite because Houston is a, by far a better offense in general. they got by far better hitters. Um, and Gosman is not DeGrom, right? 28% is not 43% in the strikeout department. But this is still workable. And if he's going to go deep into games, then it gives Gosman a lot more value than just throwing 90 pitches a start. If he's throwing 95-plus every single start, that's effectively one more hitter. That could be one more out one more strikeout, or one more inning, all right? So if we're talking 10 pitches, for example. So I think Gosman is a, a decent tournament play here. Um, we can attack him. We want to, well, we generally don't want to attack him, um, but it's going to be with some fly ball hitters, some guys that can get the baseball on a line. The line drive rate to right-handers is very worrisome. And this is one of the highest numbers in the league that you're going to find, 27% line drive rate. So you want to get to him mostly with righties and guys that can get to baseball in the air. Hard contact is higher to righties. The splitter is a better pitch against lefties. That's why you see a higher soft contact, lower hard contact, and a lower line drive rate, sub 20% to the left side. So if we do want to attack him, it's mostly with same-handed hitters, despite the fact that they have a 30% strikeout rate. So there's going to be some whiffs here, I think, and Gosman has some upside due to how cold Houston's offense really has been um, outside of Jordan Alvarez. Everybody else has just kind of been pretty terrible. They're really missing Jose Altuve and Michael Brantley in the middle of the lineup. Everybody else has kind of been um, pretty disappointing so far. So I think you can target some Gosman. On the other side, Christian Javier at 9,200. I think this is an okay tournament play as well. We saw Shane McClanahan really tear apart the Blue Jays yesterday. Um, he was good. Went six innings, struck out seven, I think. And Javier certainly has the strikeout stuff to get you there as well. Uh, we're worried, generally, about targeting 
um, targeting the Blue Jays with fly ball pitchers, and that's mostly because they hit, they have a, a ground ball lean, and they don't strike out, right? They will get the baseball in the air and on a line. Javier is a little bit more, a uh, little bit more playable than than a maybe a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy with a, an average line drive rate. His fly ball rate is is very very high. That's because he relies almost exclusively on the four seamer slider. He does throw the curveball in. Could be a little bit of a miscategorization here, but um, doesn't throw the changeup. Good thing because he'd get you know these numbers would be markedly worse. But he's mostly just a two pitch guy with the four seamer slider. Two really good pitches that give him a very high fly ball rate. So in general, when we want to attack fly ball pitchers. Um, well, we don't want it to be this heavy in the fly ball arena. And when they've got good strikeout stuff like this, that makes them decent targets on the mound for us in tournaments. And at, at depressed ownership, even against a team that's aggregate, in aggregate, not going to strike out like the Blue Jays, 20% so far, um, they will hit for a little bit of power, 160 ISO. This is a little bit better number. They're walking a decent bit. 9%. These are probably going to be the numbers for the Blue Jays against righties for the rest of the season. But do we want to be paying these price tags? 59 for Bo Bichette. 53 for Springer is okay. 58 for Vladdy. Uh, 49 for Chapman in this particular matchup. I, I don't want that at all. He's a fly ball hitter. Um, so these price tags over here for the Blue Jays, I'm not super wild about outside of maybe a Springer. Dalton Varsho, I believe, got scratched. He is sick, I think. Um, they do have, what, a Brandon Belt who can who can get to a righty. But those guys are, are, are fly ball hitters, and you generally don't want to be stacking fly ball hitters against fly ball pitchers. Right? That turns into a lot of outs. So I think both sides um, of of our pitching matchup here are playable in tournaments. Christian Javier, I like the price tag a little bit here. Uh, it's going to keep his ownership down given the existence of DeGrom and, and all the other guys, of course, right? Uh, but I think this is a playable construction here to get to a little bit of Javier. We have questions with him throwing strike one as well. It's 56%. This is a worrisome number. And if you can get a ground ball hitting team in aggregate, um, you know, that, that hit a lot of line drives. And Toronto definitely will do that. To attack him and he starts walking the whole country, then, yeah, you could see a big number pop out from um, from the offense on the other side of Javier. But uh, for the most part, I think I, I would side with Javier in this matchup. Um, but you can play some of the Blue Jays if you want to get really off the board. Nobody's going to play them. And it's mostly because of their pricing. They're they're flat out overpriced for the matchup. But uh, you can get to really both sides here. I'm probably off of Houston for the most part, outside of you know a, a Jordan Alvarez, um, maybe a maybe an Alex Bregman. I'm not sure that his price tag off the top of he top of my head, but um, he doesn't strike out and he'll make a lot of pretty decent contact. So well, okay, let's move on to uh, Pittsburgh and Colorado. Rich Hill on the mound. He's we don't even have to go through it. He throws a curveball, and it's not going to break at altitude. So we're we're not going near it. Even at 6,000, he'd have to be 2,000, I think, to consider this. Um, now, he's throwing a lot of junk anymore. He'll come down three quarters and, like, totally submarine it and things like that just to kind of survive. Uh, but he's still throwing the curveball as the main part of his arsenal here, full 36%, mixing in, at least over the last season, more of the four-seamer. He was a bit more, um, I mean, he was nearly 40, 45% curveballs in, in the last couple of years. So this is flattened out a little bit because he's trying to stay in the league a little bit longer. Um, but nevertheless, you can't play him at Coors Field. You're going to stack Colorado, definitely. And if you see depressed ownership on the Rockies, I think that's a pretty good opportunity to jump on board, despite the fact that they are a bad, bad, bad offense. Uh, they got torn apart again yesterday by Luis Castillo in Seattle. He was perfect into the seventh inning, I think. So um, tough offense to stack over here, but you get him at Coors Field against Rich Hill, who's got a you know below average strikeout rate, and his main, one of his main pitches is not going to break uh, at altitude. So go ahead and stack the Rockies. On the other side, Kyle Freeland, 7,100. You're not playing him either. Um, there might be a little bit of value. He's been good 
to start the season. No strikeout stuff from free pretty much ever. Um, so you're really counting on suppression. And I think the, the Pirates here are a little bit sticky. We still like playing them despite missing O'Neill Cruz at the top of the lineup. They've got a couple of other guys that they can just kind of filter in here that are also a little pesky at the plate. Now, this lineup is their their go-to against left hand, or excuse me, against right-handers. They get a lefty, obviously, on the mound today, but um, they'll probably have Cabrian Hayes leading off again. Right, they got Miles Michaelis yesterday. Um, Brian Reynolds hits from both sides, 6,000. You, you got to pay for him, and you got to pay for Kutch, but everybody else is very attainable, and in early ownership runs, we're actually not seeing a hell of a lot of um, elevated ownership on the Pirates. Yeah, they're going to be 15% for sure. But it's not the 25% that the Cardinals were like last week, right? So, um, and these guys are all very cheap. They're underpriced for the upside that they provide at Coors Field. They're going to make a good bit of contact. Now, they're striking out against lefties at least. 100, 150 PA is very short sample. 25% K rate so far. 12% walk rate. So they're patient. And that's mostly buoyed by like a Carlos Santana who walks at a 80% clip himself. Um, but hitting for a little bit more power this season, as you can see, 10-15% or whatever on these guys, hitting for a little bit more power this season in aggregate with a 140 ISO. Last season, I think this was down near like 120 or something. So a little bit sticky, and of course, they get Coors Field. So um, we're not playing any pitching here. I'm not playing any pitching here. You want to get to a couple of random Kyle Freeland teams? Well, no, but if you land on them at 7,100, like I said, we're kind of starving for value in the in the 7K range. He is an option, and he can suppress you for six innings or something. He's not going to strike anybody out, but it's it's reasonable at this price tag that, that he can pop for 18 points um, or something like that, and and he can get through the Pirates here. Because overall, they've, they've been struggling against lefties. So um, not the best spot to be targeting... Uh, pitchers on the mound, of course, right? But um, you know, of course, we're mostly siding with uh, siding with offense here. But uh, Freeland isn't the craziest tournament play in the world. Uh, Rich Hill, I think, would be. Uh, okay, moving on. Milwaukee and Seattle Brewers. They got Corbin Burns going, and they really need to get him going. And he was good, and is very good in his last start. Nearly threw a complete game. Um, Flexing on the other side for the Mariners, you're not touching him. He got beat up really good in his last start. So I think we could probably get to some Brewers again today. That said, there's probably a little bit of upside for Flexen at 5,600 to pop to about 15 points. So if you need that, yeah, maybe. Um, but I don't really want to go after the Brewers. Brewers here early in the season, 22.5% K rate, 115 WRC plus and 500 PAs against righty so far. Walking a lot. So that's coming down. We've talked about this every time we get the Brewers on the slate. Coming down a little bit, but still sneaky high ISO, 161 here. When these guys get going, they're going to hit the ball over the wall. 351 Woba, that's a big number for a, a team aggregate with that kind of sample of 500 PA. So I think you can get to some Brewers here for sure, uh, and it's the usual suspects. Don't have the salaries there in the sheet, but you can play Yelich, 4,800. This is an okay spot to pay 4,800 for Yelich. Uh, Flexen's not going to throw it past him even though Yelich may very well still strike out. Um, Rowdy, 3,500. Price still hasn't come up. He's a very good play, very good tournament play. Uh, Garrett Mitchell, 3,000 flat, also an excellent tournament play. You could play Willie Contreras behind the plate, 3,800. Very strong, pretty much all, all around here. I like the Brewers a good bit as another cheap stack that you can get to. Probably not going to see any ownership on them or all that much just because of the other teams that you've got going. So um, targeting Chris Flexen, we like to do that. Mostly with same-handed hitters. Uh, now, the cutter has actually kept him alive, but it's not all that great a pitch. Um, he brought it back over from the KBO where he developed it, but he still gives up power to same-handed hitters here. 282 average, 358 wobe, but a 215 ISO with a 14% K rate, and a nearly 2-0 homers per nine to the right side. Doesn't have a breaking pitch. He's got an okay slider that he'll, he'll throw in there occasionally, uh, and that's because the cutter is, is also all right. 
I wish he'd throw the slider more and and rely less on on the four seamer. Go to a heavy cutter slider mix with the changeup. That's a more workable arsenal than a bad fastball trying to survive here with as a four pitch guy. But um, certainly with this amount in the arsenal at a full 40% on the four seamer, that's, that's way too high given the extreme negative value. Um, so I wish he would take 10, 15% of that usage, dump it over here to the slider. And I think that would help neutralize this right-handed power uh, quite a bit. Um, that said, he's still going to, he's still going to pitch to a lot of contact um at a full 79 80% here no strikeout rate he's going to walk some people too so he's got a little bit of trouble spotting this fastball and that's why it's such negative value for him so um we want to get to the brewers for sure corbin burns we haven't talked about him yet 8800 i think is a very playable price tag again and i think the field kind of agrees now do we want to go after seattle with 35% of our teams? I don't know. Um, even on a nine-game slate when we have Gosman, DeGrom, some other strikeout pitchers that we can get to. Lance Lynn has Ks. Um, Christian Javier has Ks, right? Do we want to be doing that? I mean, it, Corbin Burns still a 30% K rate, and you can't really fake that. Um, and Seattle here in the early going against righties, 500 PAs striking out at a 23% clip. So they're attackable, just neutral creation so far 100 wrc plus 143 iso 311 woba so below average for a really kind of a power lineup or what we're expecting to be a power lineup over here in seattle so they're attackable for sure and they're going to have some guys that are still going to whiff at 8800 and pretty elevated ownership undoubtedly it, like your chalk pairing is going to be like a degrom and a corbin burns here uh, almost certainly. You can get off of some of this if you play DeGrom. You can also get off of some of the DeGrom ownership if you play Corbin Burns. I think it's probably a pretty good idea to have one of these two guys in most of the, the lineups you create. But if you get off the board a little bit, that's going to instantly differentiate you in tournaments uh, just with your arms. Then you can play whoever the hell you want. So... Um, I wouldn't, I'm certainly not Xing Corbin Burns or anything like that. We wanted, like, he was very, very good in his last start, and it was super encouraging. Arizona, probably a, overall a, a weaker offense than the Mariners, but in the early going here, maybe not so much. So some exploitability, and we can attack the Mariners uh, lineup over here, I think, um, with, a, with a good amount of Corbin Burns. Now, do we want to get 40, 50% of him? Yeah, I don't know, but... Still has the, the strike one susceptibility here. But it looks like he was um, very comfortable in his last start. And, and the numbers are probably going to end up, you know, just exactly where they were last year. Um, he'll be fine. But, you know, over his last six, eight starts, he has not been great overall, um, you know, despite nearly throwing a complete game in his last start. So um, talent is obviously still there. So we're still eating some some risk when we click into a guy at 35-40% ownership. Um, so we have to keep that in the back of our mind. Just because he had one good start does not mean, you know, it definitely doesn't erase the last seven or eight bad starts, right? But nevertheless, you know, I don't want to dog on Burns too much here. This is a good price tag, and the ownership is attainable. You can still get different, uh, and the numbers are still great. So... Um, go ahead and give me a good bit of the Brewers here. I'm not sure I want to be going after Burns, but if you want to take shots on a very high upside lineup with the Mariners, uh, I don't think that's necessarily bad. Okay, Atlanta and San Diego. Freed on the mound. Like I said, he's coming back from a hamstring. 8100 for him. This is a good price for him. Um, and I believe he's the exact same price as Lance Lynn, right? Probably, side with Lance Lynn, just in the raw strikeout matchup, uh, Padres have been far, far better against lefties so far this season, in a short sample, of course, than they have against righties. They've been kind of attackable against righties, but 18.5% K rate and 250 PAs against lefties, no thank you. Um, no, I'm, I'm not doing it. Now, I love Max Freed. He's got an excellent pitch mix, good four-seamer, good sinker, good slider, good curveball, good change. This makes it very difficult to go after him because he's got so many pitches. Um, he's 
he's fantastic against both sides of the plate. 22.5% K rate to right. He's a little bit of the downside of his split in in that metric, but 26% K rate to lefties. He doesn't give up any power to righties. You're not worried about any of this. 103 ISO, 062 ISO to left-handers. So the hard contact numbers are great. The soft contact suppression to right-handers is fantastic as well, over 21%. I mean, it, it, all the numbers are good. Doesn't walk anybody. He stays off the barrel, gets heavy ground balls, and strikes guys out. So this is overall a pitcher that we want to target in general. Very low ownership. You want to throw in a couple of, if you're not crazy about playing a Lance Lynn against the Phillies, um, I think that's fine to throw in a couple of Max Freed teams at 8% ownership. The Padres... Like like I said, this is a very workable arsenal. The the only thing we're going to run into is like I said, the uh, the very low strikeout rate. And they're hitting for a good bit of power here. 317 Woba with a 183 ISO so far in the early going. Even though they haven't created just yet, it's mostly just because they're putting or stranding runners. So they are also going to get Tatis back sometime this week. I'm not sure if it's for this series. Um, I don't think so. So Labs doesn't have him projected just yet. So probably not. Um, but he is coming back, and that'll make these numbers against lefties even better. So uh, I think he's an okay tournament piece. And if you need to get different, if you're playing a very chalky stack with a Degrom Burns combo or something, uh, or a, a a Degrom like Coors Field stack or, or something that gets you very popular, um, you need to throw in a Max Fried. I think this is an okay price to land on it 8100 for him uh he's underpriced for the upside that he offers for sure Padres on the other side they get Ryan Weathers going 5200 for him um I did we're not doing we're not dealing with this he's probably only going to go about three four innings um number one so even at 5200 I, I think he's probably overpriced for that and he gets the Braves on the other side uh 6500 for Acuna today sheesh um but like the guy gets on and and he, he steals bases, and he just doesn't stop. So um, very good to see that he's come back so healthy from tearing apart his knee uh, a couple of seasons ago. Uh, Austin Riley, 56. It's fine. 44 for Sean Murphy after his big day on Saturday and then a zero yesterday. Uh, there's going to be variance with Murphy. Um, so he was bad, but you could get to him for sure. Uh, Ozzy Albies, 4,600. I think this is an attainable price tag at at second base for him. Um, he got into a ball yesterday, also had a double, I believe. Vaughn Grissom, still waiting for him to really kind of pop uh, once again, but he is a cheap shortstop play if you need to get there. Um, unlikely that Trump will be in the lineup, but he's got a lot of pop if he can make contact. So if you want to get to some of the Braves here. I think they're probably going to be pretty popular up there with the Pirates as um, probably the most one of the most popular stacks today. Now, these ownership numbers will change, but we'll give you a sneak peek here. As we can see, pretty much everybody on the Braves north of 10 12%. So um, they're going to be popular as well, targeting Ryan Weathers, which may give us an opportunity to get a little bit different uh, in tournaments with some of our hitters. So we're not doing we're not dealing with probably any of the Padres today. If you want to play like a Manny, um, that's fine. 5,200, this is a good price for Manny. That's okay. And Free has just the 22% K rate, as we mentioned, against right-handers. So um, that's that's attainable if you want to play that. Bogarts as well at 51. Those are playable price tags. Not crazy about really getting to anybody else. If you want to make it a three-man with a Hassan Kim who doesn't strike out, 2,800, that's okay. Um, not wild about Nelson Cruz here, but 4,300, he's still showing a little bit of pop. Not a terrible three-man there. Probably fully staying off of Juan Soto today. So mostly the Braves and some Max Reed here, maybe some short Padres stacks. Cubs and the A's, uh, we're going a little bit long here, so try to get to these last couple of games pretty quickly. Hayden Wisniewski on the mound, he was bad in his last start, but he wasn't nearly as bad as the seven runs allowed, or whatever it was, would suggest. Uh, he only gave up like three earned or something. There were two errors in an inning that really ballooned the pitch count. He certainly didn't have his best control, of course, um, and that's a susceptibility for him. Sub-60% strike one rate makes it a little bit difficult for him to get out of some holes, especially when 
he doesn't put himself in those holes. Um, but he still has a workable arsenal here. The the early going on Wisniewski is that he's still a, a very promising young arm, but there's going to be some variance with him and some growing pains. Um, the contact numbers in the early going, not excellent. 239, 232 average to righties and lefties, respectively. 325, 298 Woba to righties and lefties, respectively. Fine numbers. It's where we get into the power and the and the contact that is a little bit more worrisome. 161 ISO to lefties, 185 ISO to righties. Not horrible, but with just a 22% strikeout rate that he's exhibiting so far, a little bit too much contact for my overall liking. However, I love this price at 6300 and he gets Oakland, who is terrible. Uh, 78% contact rate for Wisniewski so far. It's fine. It's not bad contact necessarily, right? Not on the barrel, and it's not hard contact. Sub-30% to lefties is a good number, and 21% hard contact rate to righties. Really good number. That's because his, his slider is probably his best pitch so far. So, uh, it's fine, and I think we can expect a, a pretty decent bounce performance from Wisniewski, and this is a very attainable price tag. Low ownership here so far. Now, with a a guy that's not going to necessarily blow it by all of the A's, you could play some athletics here. They've been sticky here in the, in the early going. Against righties, they're only striking out at a 23% clip, creating at a 101 WRC+. Now, zero power, right, an 097 ISO. But they're walking, 9% walk rate with a 311 WOBA. So they have been a little bit attainable um, in some spots with guys that can get wild a little bit. And it, in the early going, was Nesky having a bit of trouble spotting the four-seamer seeker combo? Changeup has been really bad. But um, at a really off-the-board stack, if you want to target another guy, with a, a, a really cheap stack, then I, I think Oakland is viable, uh, probably well down the list. I think I'd rather get to the Brewers and like Arizona, uh, for example, definitely like Pittsburgh. Um, but we saw that Wisniewski can unravel pretty quickly, and you know if the Cubs defense aids him in that, uh, or doesn't aid him in that, I suppose, um, pretty much anybody can put up a crooked number. So. They've got some cheap hitters here. Tony Kemp, I, I'd, I'd like playing this kid as more more so a cash play, but you can play him in tournaments sometimes. Um, he's cheap, 3500 2700 Ryan Noda got plenty of pop leading off. Jace Peterson, plenty of pop. Probably have him in the top half of the lineup as well. Brent Rooker uh, is still Babe Rooker over here, 2700 for him. Um, Ramon Laureano, probably the most raw power, I would say, but some variance for sure with with Ramon um so it, a couple of playable pieces here definitely not my favorite full stack uh, if you want to mix in a piece here or there as a singleton that's fine if you want a three stack some of these guys I think that's okay too uh, but would mostly side with Wisniewski here attacking Oakland um in general 23 percent K rate like I said about average against righties they haven't seen a lot of righties so far this season just 145 PAs so far so they've seen mostly lefties I think Anybody with any sort of semblance of stuff, and Wisniewski has a good slider. Uh, he could probably pick through Oakland's Oakland's overall pretty weak lineup, low upside lineup, um, and certainly a 6300. I think it's a good tournament play. Projection probably fine. 10% ownership so far uh, looks pretty good to me. Kyle Muller on the other side. I don't think he can do this. However, 6600. Uh, getting the Cubs, um, I would like to get to the Cubs a little bit. He's only going to strike out about 18% of guys. Short sample on Muller, uh, but he really has never had any strikeout, raw strikeout upside. He's had some trouble throwing strikes. 56% strike one and a 12% walk rate so far, so that's very worrisome. Naturally, it's super noisy, just 21 hitters and four and two-thirds against lefties so far. Um, but this is six starts, so these are starts for him against right he's 283 average 341 woba not translating so much into power just yet but a 32 percent hard contact rate it's because he's been getting some some ground balls so far staying down in the strike zone but throwing just a four seamer slider 
The curveball is keeping him down a little bit with a 2-1 to one ground ball to fly ball uh, so far. But relying on a four-seamer slider mix, that'll, that'll drop that ground ball to fly ball ratio and give it more of a fly ball lean if he keeps the if he keeps limiting the curveball and the changeup usage to these, you know, sub-15% or so. Um, you know, that said, I mean, you can't take any stock in a 9.0 ground ball to fly ball that he's got against lefties, like whatever, right? So um, I think we can go after Kyle Marler with some Cubs. Nobody's going to be playing the Cubs. Nobody ever plays the Cubs because, well, you really don't want to be playing the Cubs. But they do have Seiya Suzuki back, and he looked, he's looked fine in his, in his first couple of starts back from the oblique. Um couple of guys from the Cubs, and certainly we like playing Nico at the top of the lineup. Uh, doesn't strike out at all. Good hitter. Got a, gotten a price drop, actually. 3900 Dansby at 56 Still perfectly attainable here. And slightly sneaky elevated run total over here on the Cubs. So I think we can get to them as well. Trey Mancini still free. Patty Wisdom, plenty of power against lefties, definitely. And more attainable price tag, finally, at 3900 You can play him now down in the six hole. That's okay. Um, and you got a cheap catcher piece. Jan Gomes with some pop. Um, Nelson Velasquez also has a, a decent bit of pop as well. So you can get to the Cubs and pretty much stack them a lot of interesting ways. Now, it is 50 degrees in Oakland uh, in a big ballpark so it, at night. Um, so that's we're always – we've always got that to deal with uh, when we play games in Oakland. But that said, no, uh, no um, Kyle Muller or really much of the A's for me. I would prefer most of the Cubs side and a good bit of Wisniewski. All right, last game of the day. Uh, we're going long here. But um, David Peterson on the mound for the Mets. I think we could probably safely avoid him. However, however, we did see that Justin Steele tore apart the Dodgers. He was fantastic. We were, as, as we mentioned, we've been lacking a good bit of 7K-ish value. And 6,800 for David Peterson, a guy that, he, like, he's got seven, 27% K rate here. Like, the problem with him is that he cannot throw strikes. 54% strike one rate and 11% walk rate. I'm not dealing with this in most scenarios against Dodgers. Uh, he gives up power to the left side, 180 ISO. A little noisy there, I, I would say. But it's mostly because his four-seamer is just neutral value. Sinker's neutral value. So when he's, when he's throwing those pitches to same-handed hitters, they're mostly flat and not, not doing a whole hell of a lot for him. A lot of hard contact to lefties. 36%, one and a half homers per nine, 11% walk rate. So that's worrisome. 2-0 ground ball to fly ball to right-handers. So we'd want like some big fly ball hitters from the right side. Uh, Mookie against lefties, fine, of course. Uh, and we can play, where is he? Chris Taylor. He's cheap, but unfortunately he's probably going to hit down to the bottom of the lineup. Uh, Dodgers did just pick up Austin Wins um, because they are probably putting Will Smith on the on the DL. I think he's sick or something like that. No matter, like he's still seven thousand or whatever his price tag is. You're not paying for that. Trace Thompson though, really good play here. Twenty nine hundred, you can play him. Twenty seven hundred for for Miguel Vargas. Miggy Rojas might be back um, at shortstop. I think he's been sick as well. In any case, he's 3000 doesn't strike out at all. So, J.D. Martinez, of course, 4400 This is a playable price tag now. You can get to the Dodgers, definitely. They're much more playable. And once again, late night Max Muncy, he's going to hit. And against somebody that gives up power to lefties, I think it's a pretty shrewd tournament play, to be quite honest. Nobody's going to play him because he's flat overpriced. But he has the upside when he's seeing the baseball, man. This guy gets hot, and he goes crazy. So, um... I like getting to the Dodgers. you got to pay for Mookie and Freddie, of course, but you can play, play Freddie against everybody. So I like the Dodgers here as kind of an off-the-board stack as well uh, on a full nine-game slate. So this is a very attainable attainable piece down here. Dustin May for the Dodgers on the other side, 8,400. I'm not crazy about this. Um, the Mets in the early going, 350 PAs, 17% strikeout rate against right-handers. Not creating a whole hell of a lot, but this is kind of who the Mets are. They're they're just going to hit for average, um, despite a 201 average right now. They're walking so much right now, so it's noisy, and these numbers are going to normalize quite a bit. But in aggregate, a 315 wOBA, it's kind of a, a 
representation a better representation than than his OPS. So 315 Woba, that's about league average, and that's mostly where they're going to end up because these are some good hitters over here. And against against righties, they can still make it uh, pretty difficult on a guy that's not going to blow it by them all that often. He does have gas, right? Does Dustin May, but um, the strikeout rate leaves a little bit on the table. Just 21% K rate for May. No power that he gives up. So I'm not sure I want to be stacking the Mets here. But you can get to a Frankie Lindor. 4800 I'm not wild about this price tag, of course. Uh, but he's really seeing the baseball from both sides of the plate here. Brandon Nimmo, 42 This is okay. Not a lot of raw upside for him in general. But 4200 he might be able to squeeze out some upside from that price. Jeff McNeil, he's just a... Uh, a contact hitter for you, kind of in the middle of the lineup. Danny Vogelbach, uh, obvious, obviously plenty of pop. He'll probably be in here. Do we want to go after Dustin May? Not really. Like I said, just doesn't give up a lot of power. Better strikeout numbers against the left side so far, but still a short sample on May. Um, if he can really develop this cutter a little bit more, this will make him completely deadly, throwing as hard as he as hard as he does. Uh, and this will give him some more strikeout stuff. But um, as of right now, not my favorite. You've got both Max Fried and Lance Lynn there at 8,100. I think I'd probably rather get to uh, the Mets. I just don't like going after them, despite the fact that they don't have all that much upside. And also despite the fact that they don't, or that they put up 17 runs against Oakland over the weekend. So uh, mostly the Dodgers here. Probably no pitching. I mean, if I land on a David Peterson I, okay, but I'm really not all that stoked about it. Uh, so that's it for the breakdown. Uh, let's quickly go over stacks. Um, maybe some sneaky offense here. You want to target some Phillies against Lance Lynn? Yeah, he gives up power to the left side. Go ahead. Um, Wheeler, I think, is probably going to get left off in a lot of teams uh, because of Gosman and, and DeGrom ahead of him. Uh, Texas and Kansas City, all of Texas and none of Jordan Lyles. Um, all of DeGrom and none of the Royals. So there we go. Uh, Arizona I like a little bit here. And you could probably a deep tournament stack the Cardinals against Merrill Kelly. He's not going to strike him out. Uh, he may very well suppress them for seven innings, though. Uh, Cardinals have been really cold. Um, Toronto and Houston, mostly pitching here for me. If you want to get to a couple of one-offs of, of Toronto, I think that's probably okay. You can always play Jordan, uh, of course. Uh, Pittsburgh and Colorado, offense only, of course. And it, you're probably going to have to make some decisions ownership-wise. Pirates are just too cheap in general outside of um, Brian Reynolds. Milwaukee and Seattle. Give me the Brewers again against Chris Flexen. I like that. Do like Corbin Burns, too, at, at 8800 Attackable price tag there against an underperforming lineup so far in Seattle. Uh, Atlanta and San Diego. Atlanta going to be pretty popular against Ryan Weathers here. You might be able to pivot off of them if their ownership steams too much. Give me some Max Free too. Uh, I think this is okay because he's got such a workable arsenal. Like Wisniewski and the Cubs, definitely, probably no Oakland. Mets and Dodgers, mostly just the Dodgers. No Dustin May, and probably no David Peterson. Just give me the Dodgers here. Uh, so that's it for the breakdown. Once again, guys, keep an eye out for projection updates um, and enjoy the very early baseball that we've got. We've got the uh, Angels and I forget who, uh, somebody. They're They're playing it like. 8, 9 a.m. Pacific or something, 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, and Boston, Brian Bayo's uh, first start of the year, so keep an eye out for him. Kid's got a lot of upside going forward. Big strikeout rate, can't throw strikes, but um, enjoy the day baseball. You got Shohei on the mound, so hopefully the Angels can be better than they were yesterday, and hopefully this offense can start to heat up. They have been terrible. Uh, so that's it uh, for Monday. We'll see you guys tomorrow night for likely a very big Tuesday slate. Good luck.